Um, thanks, Shumandro, and thanks everyone um, for, for inviting me here and for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I, uh, I accepted this invitation with a little bit of trepidation uh, because I have spent many, many years now trying to figure out what open data actually means. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago when, um, uh, when, when I first started working in the area of what at, the, what at that time was loosely defined as governance, the two words that were very much in vogue uh, that defined the space in which, um, uh, which I had begun working were accountability and transparency. Um, uh, accountability, actually there were three, accountability, transparency and participation. And it, it's, it's quite interesting to see how words uh, evolve and uh, the meanings they acquire. Uh, because about five years ago, maybe somewhere between 2010 and 11, um, as we began work, as, as our uh, work on accountability at the Accountability Initiative was beginning to take off, um, I started uh, interacting with people who seemed to define our work in the context of open government and open data. Uh, and it seemed that uh, new definitions arrive uh, on the scene and become uh, hot and fancy and uh, work gets sort of slotted into these different places and since then I've been trying to make sense of what open data actually means. Um, so I thought I'd use this opportunity to maybe share with you a little bit about how I, how I think about open data in this larger landscape of accountability, transparency and governance. Um, and, and pose a few thoughts and questions for you as you go through the deliberations for the day. Um, I know very little about the technologies of open data, so I have nothing much to contribute there, uh, except for saying uh, we'd really love at Accountability Initiative to learn how to use technologies for, 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 for deepening our work of, uh, with data. So any suggestions and any thoughts to my colleagues, Vikram and Ashwarya, who are going to be here uh, through the day will be very welcome. Um, with that plug, <laughs> Uh, to plunge into some of the, um, the, the, the sort of contextual fact things that, I, that I've been thinking of. Um, I, like, I like to think about open data in the context of what I usually define as, a, as, a, as, as, as the technologies of governance. Um, and, I, 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 and, and, and in my thinking about how different people um, and different discourses have used the terms governance, accountability, transparency, and data. Um, I, I loosely sort of slot them into two broad, two, two, two and a half broad categories. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, and, and, and those categories are important because depending on where you sit, you think about this, you think about data and what data can do uh, from, the, from the perspective of uh, strengthening accountability and transparency somewhat differently. Um, and, and, and as we, uh, and I don't think that it's important to pass judgment on which, which thinking is the right thinking, but I think the implications of these are important and it's important to consider them as we think about using data uh, from the perspective of strengthening accountability and transparency of governance. Um, so I, I broadly say what, what I, I think about this in two, in two main categories. One is a category uh, which I loosely call sort of the rights and welfare uh, framing of thinking about accountability, transparency, and the use of data in that context. Uh, this rights and welfare framing had, uh, of course, over the last 10 years in, uh, uh, in, in the previous political environment gained a lot of credence. But the important thing about uh, the rights and welfare framework is that they saw data or information rather as a tool for empowerment and as a tool for shifting the power dynamic between citizens and the state in a very, very fundamental way. Uh, the, the, the framing of the right of information in India as a right, I think, is an extremely important part of, uh, of how this discourse evolved. Uh, because they, they, the, the idea was that information is not just something that citizens can access, but information is something that is a deep fundamental right for citizens. Which in the, and the process of accessing that information automatically starts moving or shifting the power dynamic between citizens and the state. And as citizens start accessing more and more information, they have the power to ask questions and place accountability demands on the state in, in ways that deepen and strengthen one's notion of citizenship uh, in a democratic setting. So, so the whole idea of information, uh, data is information, data emerging out of that and, and being used as information to place to, to, to 
question, to place claims, to assert one's citizenship uh, is, is one way of framing um, how data is used and what open data actually means. The other technology of governance um, is, is what I loosely call the sort of techno-managerial approach to data. Um, and, and that too has been popularized a lot in the last 10 years and in fact is very much, I think, part of the discourse of technology, uh, of, of transparency, accountability, open government and open data, even in the current political environment. It was quite interesting to me to, to notice that uh, within, uh, within less than two hours of Prime Minister Modi being sworn in, uh, when they put up the new Prime Minister PMO website, one of the first things that they said was that his government believes in transparency, accountability, and, and there were some examples of how he defined that. And it was very much in terms of using technology, and by technology I use the word technology now in the traditional sense of technology, uh, to place data and information in the public domain. Um, and, 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 and in this framing, technology becomes the most important facilitator of trying to influence efficiency and effectiveness of government. Um, and we see this in myriad ways across the country. Let me give you a few examples. Um, uh, some years ago, we were working on the midday meal scheme. And um, uh, we, uh, we discovered that in Uttar Pradesh, this, 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 uh, uh, this technology was first used in Uttar Pradesh. Every day, somewhere between 10 in the morning and 12 in the afternoon, every single headmaster would get a phone call on his or her mobile phone. The phone would ring. They would pick it up, and if they didn't pick it up, this, the phone would ring and a half an hour later. So in a, invariably, you would get the call and you would have to pick up the phone. And a voice recording system would ask, Kitne bacho ne aaj khana khaya? The voice recording system would ask, how many children have had a meal uh, in the school? And the headmaster would be expected to punch this information in. Having punched this information in, it would go, it, the, the data would be, uh, uh, the IVRS system would enter the data into a back-end system and in real time, anyone sitting at a block office or a district office would be able to see how many children in a particular school in Hardoi, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, had, had eaten a, or, or to use the technical government term, availed of a midday meal on that particular day. Um, similarly, uh, I saw in Bihar, again I'm using these examples because these are places where one doesn't think of uh, technology as being the most accessible form of getting things done, uh, but it's being deployed even in the most uh, hostile of settings, so to speak. Um, in Bihar, I discovered in the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, uh, which uh, in, in its heydays was the most obvious thing for any district magistrate who wanted to make his or her way to Delhi as quickly as possible to pick up and make sure that they got right. Uh, uh, so in order to ensure that their officers were actually doing their job, uh, all the program officers at the block level were handed over GPRS phones. They were expected to take these GPRS phones and go around to different work sites when they were doing their monitoring. So one of the big concerns was that officers don't do what they're supposed to do, so how do we ensure that they actually do their jobs? So the GPRS phones were given, they were expected to keep, it, keep their data on and go wherever it is that they were to go to do their monitoring, take a photograph of that website, of, of the work site in which they were. They use that photograph, upload it immediately onto, um, uh, onto a back-end system, so that the district magistrate sitting in his or her office would in real time be able to see whether or not the officer was showing up uh, and doing the job that he or she was supposed to do. And we're seeing this very much the use of these technologies, even in the conversation that we're having over the last six months about improving governance in Delhi, so officers now are being expected to put a use by biometrics are being deployed to ensure that officers show up uh, at the various Sarkari Bhavans on time and exit their Sarkari Bhavans at the appropriate uh, end of the eight hour workday so that they, they do the job that they're supposed to do. Uh, so I use these examples to say that the, the, tech, uh, the technology of the use of, the, of technology as a, and, and, and data um, from a techno, techno managerial perspective is really thinking about data as a means to ensure and enhance efficiency. Uh, the third, the, the third and, and linked to that, of course, efficiency through ensuring that um, uh, you monitor <laughs> and you monitor in a way that creates the right kind of carrot, uh, the, the right kind of sticks. There's less talk about carrots uh, in, in, in order to ensure that people do what they're supposed to do. Um, the third kind of, and, and I call this a half because I'm not quite sure, I, I think it fits in both places. But the third place where data is being deployed very often in the, in the 
context of how we fix some of our governance uh, loopholes is in the whole context of what is, what is often now being defined as evidence-based policy making. So how do we take decisions in a manner that are anchored in, in some kind of empirical understanding, some kind of evidence uh, of, of the reality in which uh, programs are being, are, being employed, are being deployed. And I think it has been most successfully used through mechanisms of randomized controlled trials as ways of trying to understand whether policy decisions work in, in the ground, in what context and how. Um, and, 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 and in some ways this has sort of facilitated a larger conversation about how do you draw compromises between the necessities of politics and the necessities of evidence uh, in, 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 in decision making on, on how to resolve very complex social problems. Um, and it's quite interesting that there wasn't, uh, you know, very often one, uh, one used to say that politics, good, good economics and politics don't necessarily go together. Sometimes it could also be argued that good evidence and politics don't necessarily go together. Um, and, and it's sort of in that context and the push for think, using evidence as an anchor to think about uh, what would be the appropriate policy decision, make, uh, decision to take uh, has been pushed as a very important way of thinking about what open data means, what open governance means, what open government means, and how to ensure that governments take the right decisions in a manner that is account that is transparent and, and ultimately accountable for the policy objectives that it has set for itself. Um, the interesting thing about this about this sort of typology that uh, uh, that, that I used to think about what it, what open data means is that at some level it's deeply political. If we if we look at data from the perspective of how the rights or welfare approach thinks about it. It is deeply political. It's a, it is data is used as a vehicle to facilitate conflict, which could restructure or reshape the that power dynamics uh, from the ground level up. And I think the use of the RTI um, and, and some of the use of data in, in the NREJ are very, very good and important examples of precisely how this plays out. Um, uh, information can be used to ask very, very detailed questions and, uh, of the system in a context where citizens uh, have barely ever had the power to approach the government for anything. Um, I studied the social audit in the NREJ which uses the RTI as well as uses um, an MIS system to collect information on how the NREJ is being, uh, being used um, uh, in Andhra Pradesh. And while there are many sort of many elements of it that, are, uh, that, that don't work. To me, what the most powerful way in which the data was being used is that it was used by citizens to ask questions in a, in a sort of pu public setting uh, through, through the mechanism of a public hearing. And, this, and the government officers were forced to respond and provide explanations for why things look, look the way that they do. So if, if citizens say that I work for 15 days and I should be getting 200 rupees and I've only got 100 rupees in my bank account. Um, the usual dynamic between the state and citizen is, well, it will come, uh, or how dare you ask me these questions, or your information is wrong. But in this kind of context, when you have this information and when this information is being used to challenge, it pushes the state to give a response. Uh, to, 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 uh, and by response, I mean to, to, to actually give an explanation for why things are the way they are, which is very, very fundamentally different uh, of, uh, and, and a very different dynamic of the interaction between citizens and states. So, so there, is, there is a deeply political element of data, which I think the rights approach really, really understood and uses quite effectively. Of course, there are limits to that. And the limits to that are that you can keep asking the system questions, but is the system designed and aligned to be responsive and to be able to be effective. Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, conflicts will only be effective in shifting the dynamic if at some point the system is pushed to respond to that. And the social audit in Andhra Pradesh is also a good example of precisely where the limits of that come into play, uh, which is where data from the perspective of uh, using it as a technology for improving efficiency and effectiveness of administration may actually be a useful thing. Um, so for example, if, if, if I am question, uh, 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 one, of, one of the biggest reasons why uh, uh, there, 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 were, uh, there are problems in the NREJ is delays in payments. 
and technology was then, and, and this would come up consistently through the social audits and the use of technology to bring in smart card, uh, biometric banking and so on, has been one method by which this problem has been tried to be, the, the state has responded to this problem and tried to be more responsive to it uh, and ensure that there, was, that there is some improvements in, in, in payments. But at the same time, if you only think of information, if you only think of data and technology from a techno-managerial perspective, you end up losing out uh, uh, on, on what this is actually meant for and it, and it ends up becoming quite ineffective. Uh, and, and I often wonder if you need to buy GPRS codes and hand them over to your lowest officers and if you need to sit down in front of a computer and track step by step by step what the officer is doing, there's something inherently deeply wrong with how the system is organized. And if our major solution to each of these problems is to use technology as a way to tighten the screws and to monitor more, uh, we might be missing the wood for the trees here. Uh, I don't put GPRS technology on any of my colleagues. Two of them are sitting here and they can answer to that. I have no idea what they do. The expectation is that you do a job, you're, uh, for, for, uh, that, the, that the basic norms of, of functioning in the, in, in the work environment which we have are ones where you come, you do your work, you produce an output, you feel proud of that output and, uh, and you move on. The, the, your, 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 uh, you come to work to work as opposed to come to work only when somebody forces you with a GPRS phone to work and of course you will find ways of gaming the system. The, the example I gave from Bihar had many officers uh, leaving their phones at home or handing it over to a friend to go and take that photograph and upload it while they were doing whatever else they wanted to do. Uh, so, 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 so when we think of technology, when we think of data from the perspective of techno technology only, we do suffer from only deploying new innovations and new ways of using data without really asking ourselves the larger question of what the implications are. And I think I, I, I go back to, I perhaps more sympathetic to how to the right way of thinking about data. I see data as a deeply political tool and as a tool that can be used to fundamentally question, shift, and, and rearticulate. And the same goes for the evidence-based policy making way of thinking about it. I believe evidence is crucial. All our work is about data precisely because we believe that evidence is the, ought to be the starting point. But I think if you think about evidence without thinking about the larger con political context in which decisions are made, uh, we lose out on, uh, uh, on, on very, very important aspects of uh, what, what a democracy is. And we lose out on very important aspects of, of how decisions ought to be taken uh, and, and how, how, how different views ought to be represented and ought to be compromised and negotiated. Uh, and, and you also end up in, in I think, um, uh, sometimes asking the wrong question. Uh, so a lot of money gets spent doing very, very detailed data uh, collection and, and evaluations and analyses. Uh, but if you don't have the right question in mind, you may create a very beautiful sculpture, but it will add very little value. So, so I think, uh, just to sum up, it, it, I think we, we need to think about data in all these different contexts of how it contributes to enhancing technologies of governance and what it means therefore for deepening accountability and tra uh, transparency first and accountability of, of, of government. Uh, but, 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 in, but, but every time we use data, I think it's important to think about the context in which we are asking these questions, the context in which we want to use this data, and what the implications of that are. Um, and, and, and for me personally, ultimately, it's, it is really important to remember that data is deeply political. Uh, we track in our work budget data, uh, and, 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 and the reason we track that budget data is uh, not only to ensure that there is more efficiency and efficacy in, in how governments spend this money, but also to be able to use budgets as a tool for parents whose children are going to school to actually start asking questions of the school and ensuring that the school does the job that it does. So, so, so I think um, it, it, it's quite uh, different types of information, different types of data can be used in different ways. But it's always important to keep that end goal of how can this data enable a citizen to ask appropriate questions, to push boundaries, and to, and, and, and to empower themselves uh, to place accountability claims on the state. That ultimately is the primary function of data in the context of open government um, accountability and transparency.